Okay, let's start with book three of Boethius's uh, Consolation of Philosophy. <clears throat> and I'm beginning with page 47, <clears throat> where Lady Philosophy says to Boethius, uh, towards the bottom of the page, three or four paragraphs up, you would be more than eager if you knew the destination I am trying to bring you to. And Boethius says, I asked what it was, and she told me it was true happiness. Your mind dreams of it, she said, but your sight is clouded by shadows of happiness and cannot see reality. Right? So she, she wants to bring Boethius to true happiness and tells him, your mind is clouded by shadows of happiness and cannot see reality. Right? So that on the surface level, just tells you he sees shadows. And we all know what a shadow is. But, but often in my classes, I ask students to define what a shadow is. And they'll say something like, it's the absence of light. It's not quite true though. <clears throat> the shadow is an image cast by something else that has light shining behind it. So there's always gotta be something behind the solid image that produces the shadow, okay? So think about what she's saying. She's saying, your mind is being clouded by shadows of happiness. In other words, the things that you are perceiving or that you believe to be sources of happiness aren't the real sources, right? Because if they're shadows, they're images of something else, something more real, something more solid. So she says, I want to take you, bring you to true happiness. That is the true source of what that happiness is, right? And at this point, um, I probably ought to share a couple of items. So I'm going to put these up on the share screen. <clears throat> and we're going to start with this image and i'll discuss it and then i'll go to the next image um and i i think this was alluded to in either book one or book two it's going to be alluded to maybe not in book three but in book four or five so i thought i'd go ahead and share it at this point this is as it says at the top um kind of a representation of the ptolemaic system of the universe. Ptolemy was a Greek philosopher um, and he came up with this conception of, of how, the, how the universe is ordered or structured, right? Notice it's geocentric. That is, it puts the earth at the center if you look at that um, ball at the bottom. And, and then you've got nine arrows, okay? Those arrows, which are kind of arced, are meant to represent concentric spheres around the Earth. So think of the Earth as, as you know being at the center like my fist. And then that first sphere is of the moon. So it's like a circle or a, a clear ball all the way around. And then the next one is Mercury. It's a little bit larger. And then Venus, and then the Sun, and then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn the fixed stars, the prima mobile. Each one of those, as I said, is a sphere that surrounds the earth. And the farther out you go, the largest sphere surrounds the next largest, which surrounds the next largest, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, a couple of things about this conception. Everything below the orbit of the moon everything within the sphere of the moon. So that means the moon down to earth. Everything down there is called sublunary. It's below the moon, right? And what that means conceptually is everything in that sphere is changeable. It's impermanent. It is unstable, right? So human life. People go through ups and downs. We have earthquakes, we have droughts, we have plagues, we have floods, etc. hot and cold, right? 
everything beyond that, okay, is essentially unchangeable. Okay. Now it's it's with with one exception. Um, let me take that back. Okay. So after the moon, you've got the region, the sphere of Mercury, and then the sphere of Venus, and then the Sun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. In the Middle Ages, Ptolemy didn't necessarily teach this, but the philosophers of the medieval world did. The philosophers and theologians did that. Each of these spheres, so the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc., each one of those has what is called a ruling intelligence that governs it, governs it, right? That directs what that sphere does, keeps it moving as it ought to be moving, in other words. And in the Christian version of that, each of those ruling intelligences is an angelic being, right? Part of the basis for that idea, or that ideology, if you want, um, comes from the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, we find in the book of Daniel, for example, that nations have ruling intelligences. We find out in, in Daniel that, uh, I think it is uh, the angel of Persia, has been blocked by another angel, okay? And so Daniel, through his prayers, is able to aid that angel, etc. It's been a while since I've read Daniel, so I may have some of the details slightly off. But nations have angelic rulers. And then later on in the New Testament, you read St. Paul talk about the prince of the power of the air. Well, that's Satan. And the idea is that for the region of Earth, Okay, Satan is the one who has kind of control over it. C.S. Lewis really plays on this idea of ruling intelligences and such in his three book trilogy, the Space Trilogy, or what's also called the Ransom Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength, right? So notice you've got Earth down at the bottom, then Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, Notice, you know, Greek and Roman gods, etc. Saturn. Then you have the region of the fixed stars. Region of the fixed stars is just exactly what it sounds like. These are stars and such that do not move. Okay. The difference between a planet and a star. Planet comes from an old Greek word that means to move, because the planets change position in the night sky. All right. Then you have the primum mobile. Okay. Primum mobile means prime or first mover. God is outside that. The prima mobile is the first mover because God essentially makes it move. God himself is stationary. God is immobile. Doesn't mean he cannot move. It means God doesn't move. God is passionless. He's motionless. He's moveless. Okay? God is totally at rest. Right? God moves the prima mobile. When the prima mobile, that, that largest of concentric spheres on the outside moves, right, it moves what we would call to be relatively slowly. It makes one full rotation, so from up here, back to up here every 24 hours, right? As it moves, it then causes the sphere beneath it, the fixed stars, to move. Right? They move a little bit faster. Right? Um, and then Saturn, Jupiter, etc. Take the back. I don't think they do move faster. They move, etc., all the way down to Earth. This, by the way, this is the, the basis for astrology. When you are born, you know, it's kind of governed by which of these spheres. Which of the planets is ascendant, rising, you know, which is declining, all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's the Ptolemaic system. That's going to figure in <coughs> the rest of this. It's important. A lot of English literature, you have various authors, you know, referencing, etc. Okay, the next image, which I have to turn around. Turn around.
The next image is an image of Plato's allegory of the cave. Now I'm going to see if I can make that just a little bit bigger. Nope, I can't because it'll lose too much. Um, Plato's allegory of the cave is found in book seven of the Republic. The Republic is, is Plato's discussion of, of his ideal city slash nation state. Right, ruled by philosophers, no poets, etc. So, in the allegory of the cave, Plato is trying, through the voice of Socrates, is trying to get to what is really real, what is the ultimate reality, and he does so by means of this allegory. Right, allegory meaning a story told to make a point in which the images or symbols that are used in the story refer to only one thing other than themselves. Okay, so the cave is within the story a literal cave, but its referent, what it is meant to point to, is our life here on this world. It's like we live in this cave, right? So the story of the allegory of the cave is, imagine there's this cave. And the cave does have an opening to the outside world. But the people that are in the cave aren't aware of that opening to the outside world. Okay? And when I say the people in the cave, I mean, let's see for my cursor, the people down here where the cursor is moving. Hopefully you can, you can see that. Okay? So what you have down here is you have a stick figure, right? Chained up against this wall. So that the only thing the, the stick figure can see is what is directly ahead of him or her, okay? And what is directly ahead of him or her is the back wall of the cave, and he sees things on that back wall. That's all he, can, he or she can see. He or she, they cannot turn their head sideways, okay? And they're essentially born, live, and die in this position for the purpose of the allegory. All right. Now behind the wall that the individuals are chained to, and by the way, these people, the people in chains, these are us. These are everybody in, in our world, initially at least. Right? Behind that wall that, that we are chained to, so to speak, there are other people walking back and forth and they are carrying things. So big stick and on that stick, are images, right? Farther behind them, there's a fire in the cave, okay? Fire produces not only heat, but produces light. So the fire produces light beams that go from here towards this. The light beams hit the images or the things that the people behind the wall, or excuse me, in front of the wall are carrying. So the light hits those things, and what does it do? It produces then the shadows of those items on the back wall that the chained individuals see, right? This is us down here. The fire, for the purpose of the allegory, is like the sun. It's our source of light, right? The things we see are shadows of this, what is the real reality? But we don't see this, right? So, Plato suggests, now imagine that one of these individuals is released from his or her chains, okay? So, they can now turn around. They can see the wall. What has immediately happened? Their understanding of reality is altered because before they thought this was everything. They thought those images that they saw on the back of the wall was everything, okay? So they're unchained and they're taken up through the cave passage to the outside world. Now imagine what they see out here. First, 
The closer and closer they get to the entrance of the cave, what's going to happen to their eyes? They get blinded, right? It's like when you have a light off in a room for a long time, your eyes can adjust to the darkness. You flick the lights on and it's too bright. Well, that's their experience. Why? Because all the light down here is an image of light. It's not the real light, the true light. They come up here into what we would call the real world. And what and, and I by real world I don't mean you know you go from inside a building to outside. It's not that. It's everything below this surface okay, is meant to represent, to allegorize our world. Our experience, all of our experiences of reality, happiness, joy, sorrow, sadness, you know, sensual pleasures, sensual pains, etc. Okay. So they leave this, they're brought out from here and they come up to this world. And what do they experience? Well, here they experience, notice down here the light is, is the fire. Here they experience the real sun. Right? Or the way Plato puts it, the real light. Not, not our sun that we can see outside. The real light, the light of which our sun is an image, a copy of, okay? Or a foreshadowing of. So if it's a foreshadowing and an image and a copy, Compared to the brightness of the sun we can see in the sky, what is the real light like? Well, take the light of the sun and remove it to the nth degree, I guess, right? This out here is what Plato called the real world or the world of forms or ideas or ideals. This is the world from which Everything that we experience and everything we can see, touch, taste, smell, hear, feel in our world is a copy, an image. So, for example, in our world, we have one of these, okay? It's a bottle. But notice this bottle and this bottle while similar, they're what? I don't know how much you can tell. They're different in size. Okay. We have one of these. Right? But I'm sure some of you have one of these that does not look like this one. Okay. We have one of these. Okay. These are all copies or images of the real bottle. So every bottle on earth, which notice they're not all the same, they all have what about them? For lack of a better term, they have bottleness about them. They have the essence of bottles. So every bottle that exists in our world has to have certain things that make it really a bottle, right? Okay, it's gotta, it's gotta be able to contain something, okay? Does every bottle have to taper at the top like this? Not necessarily. Does it have to have a funny shaped bottom like this? Not necessarily. Part of, you know, when you get at its essence, what is its, what is its purpose? What is the purpose of every bottle? It's to contain something, right? Does it have to be water? Not necessarily, it can be milk, it can be beer, it can be wine. Does it have to be liquid? Can you get non-liquid items in bottles? That's an interesting question. You know, I can't think of any, for example, dry good that you can buy in bottles, uh, but, but maybe you can. What about one of these? Telephone. Well, what's the purpose? What's, what, what is a phone made for? 
the very word phone implies, telephone implies, you know, tele, long distance, phone, sound. It's for calling. Now, modern phones are for much more than that, right? If the NASA scientists of the 1960s had one of these, had this phone right here in their hands, they could have done everything they did to send Neil Armstrong to the moon with just this one phone. Instead, they have whole rooms full of computers because they didn't have the computing power that this thing had, right? No. Well, what about this? Book. Not every book has a paperback. But all books do have what? Pages. What about scrolls? Are scrolls books? No, they're not. They're scrolls. There's a difference. So you would have to then bring out a scroll to get to the form, the ultimate idea, the scrollness of real scrolls, right? So this world of forms of ideas and ideals, this, this is what's ultimately real. And what Plato says is the purpose of us, of humanity, is to rise in our minds to this level, to the world of forms and ideals. Why? Because if we do, or when we do, and we see, not with our physical eyes, but with our mental eyes, with the eyes of the mind, when we see the real light of truth, we will achieve <coughs> what's called the summum bonum, the highest good. That's the Latin, by the way, for it. I don't know the Greek. It's the highest good, which Plato said was ultimately God. Okay. Um, Socrates was condemned to death for being, one of the reasons he was condemned to death was supposedly for being an atheist. Socrates said, how could I be condemned for being an atheist when what I actually taught is that there's one God? He didn't believe in the pantheon. He didn't believe in Zeus and Hera, in Hephaestus and Mars and Aphrodite and and all those gods. He said, those are nothing but glorified human beings. How do we know? Look how they behave. They behave pettily. They get angry, they fight, they war, they're um, lustful, etc., etc. Okay? So, according to Plato and Socrates, the whole purpose for our existence is to rise to this level, to the highest good. And the way we do that is through training our mind and our physical actions via virtue. That's what I've got written over here, purpose of life, to achieve enlightenment, to experience and share in the summa bonum, the highest good. How? Through the pursuit of virtue and truth. Now, Socrates was told by the Oracle of Delphi you're the wisest man in the world. Socrates didn't believe it. He said, that can't be true. So he went around questioning people to try to prove that he wasn't the wisest man in the world. And what he found was all these people who thought they were wise. And he proved through his questioning they weren't wise. Right? Why was Socrates the wisest man in the world? Because he said he wasn't wise. Because of his humility. Right? Outside the oracle at Delphi, there was a stone. And on that stone was inscribed the phrase, know thyself. It's kind of like, you want the truth? Know who you are. Well, we could go back to earlier in the weakest, where Lady Philosophy tells him, you've forgotten who you are. Okay? Now, back to where we were. So she tells him, there on page 47, she wants to lead him to true happiness. All I'm looking at here is I made a series of one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven pages, just with page numbers and certain quotations I want to kind of emphasize, okay? to help manage my time. Otherwise, I'd be talking about this particular book in the Constellation of Philosophy, uh, probably for hours, and I don't really think you want that, okay? 
So, page 48 we go to. The end of the poem, she tells him, you too have seen the face of spurious good from whose ill yoke you start to raise your neck. And true good now shall penetrate your mind. Spurious. It's false good that he's seen before. Okay? But she says, now I'm going to direct your attention to the real good. Notice, however, even the false good can have a beneficial effect. The false good can lead one to the real good. Okay? So chapter two. Um, she says, let me see where I pick up here. In all the care with which they toil at countless enterprises, mortal men travel by different paths. Though all are striving to reach one and the same goal, namely happiness, the attitude, which is a good which once obtained leaves nothing more to be desired. What does she mean? She says all men are ultimately striving to reach the same goal. All men. So this means, you know, person I referred to the other day, Mother Teresa, right? Person um, on whose death they died with her, uh, Lady Diana. So they, they sought, Lady Philosophy saying, the same good. Well, who else does all people include? Hitler. Hitler sought ultimately happiness and beatitude, Lady Philosophy tells us. So did Stalin, so did Genghis Khan, so did Caesar, so did, you know, Barack Obama, so did George Washington, so did Jesus. Pick your historical personage. And we kind of sit here and think, what? How can you say that? How can you say Hitler and Jesus both sought happiness? Okay. Well, what she means is they sought those things. And I'm, for anybody of Christian faith, I'm not belittling Christianity at all. They sought those things that they believed would bring them ultimate happiness. In other words, Lady Philosophy would say, Hitler didn't sit around and think, how can I be the most rotten, terrible, horrible, dirty, rotten SOB in the world? Okay? So she goes on. So they see happiness, the attitude, which is a good which once obtained leaves nothing more to be desired. That is, once you attain happiness, once you attain beatitude, blessedness, that's what beatitude means. Once you are beatified, you are raised above, right? The, the problem's down here. She, and she says, once you get that, you don't need anything else, right? It leaves nothing else to be desired. Once you achieve total happiness, it's like, ah. Oh, you don't want for, you don't lack anything, okay? Um, so she goes on and says that men, pages 48 and 49, and women, humanity, try to find that true good that she refers to at the bottom of page 48, when she says, for the desire for true good is planted by nature in the minds of men. Planted by nature. In our very being, by virtue of being human. Okay? We have this desire. But error leads them astray towards false good. So even though we're seeking out, or, or even though we're reaching out for false good, <coughs> ultimately we're trying to reach out for the true good. It's just we're misdirected, okay? So she goes on and says, you know, 
some people think that you know true good is to not lack anything etc page 48 and 49 she says men try to find true good or to fill the desire for true good with what we've already talked about it in book two wealth gaining the respect of others by by holding high office or an office that is worthy of respect power fame a name that lives on after we're dead and pleasure we think that you know if something is pleasurable it must be good I can give you an example of how that's false, right? Most of you, many of you have probably had a drink or two. But what happens if you have a drink or two or five or six too many? You get drunk, right? Well, if that's a good, then why do you feel up the next morning, feel, wake up the next morning feeling horrible? That's an indication that it's not a true good. So page 50. Well, hold on. Um, she says, page 49, first long paragraph towards the end. So it is in these and other such objectives that the aim of human activity and desire is to be found. The aim, the goal. In fame and popularity, which appear to confer a kind of renown, or in a wife and children which men desire for the sake of the pleasure they give. Okay? And then she goes on in the next paragraph. The only thing men desire is happiness right each man considers whatever he desires above all else to be the supreme good that whatever he desires above all else that's the heart's desire kind of a thing the, the thing that moves and motivates you right and then she refers to again a clouded mind a clouded sight a clouded memory bottom of page 49 in spite of a clouded memory the mind seeks its own good that is, the mind seeks what is good for it. Though like a drunkard, it cannot find the path home. That is, it can't find its way back to its source of goodness. Right? Why is the mind drunk? Because it sought its good in other things. Right? Page 50. Right in the middle of the page. She says, these then are the things which people long to obtain. Why do they long to obtain them? Because they think it will bring them happiness. We think it will bring us happiness. What's the it? Wealth? How many people do you know think, you know, oh, if only I had more money, I'd be happy. Or if only I had more time, I'd be happy. Or, you know, if only I had nice clothes, a nice car, a nicer house, whatever. Then we get the poem. And the poem, page 50, says, My pleasure is to sing with pliant strings how mighty nature holds the reins of things. Reins, mighty nature controls reality. And how she frames her laws in providence, which keep in motion fix the globe immense. That is, it's the laws of providence to keep everything in the universe moving the way it should. How all things singly she doth bind and curb with such a bond that nothing can disturb. Right? Nothing can change these laws. Nothing can move Saturn out of its orbit, in other words. But down to the end of the poem on page 50, she's talking about the lion. You know, Oh, the line you can put chains and stuff on the lines but the line is still what even a tame line is still what a lion is a lion right and she says his latent spirit will return and cause that is let the lion get a taste of blood and what's going to happen he's going to go full lion his latent spirit will return and cause him with a roar his old self to recall 
you can pretend a lion isn't a lion. You can tame a lion, but give that lion a taste of flesh and the lion will revert to its true nature, right? Go down to the end of the poem now on page 51. All things seek the place that best becomes. That is, that best becomes them. All things seek the place that fulfills them. All right? Each thing rejoices when this is re achieved. Excuse me, when this is retrieved. And notice what that implies. That implies rocks. All right? Seek the place that best becomes. That is, rocks seek to be the best rock they can be, so to speak. Each thing rejoices when this is retrieved. Notice, retrieved. What does that tell us? What does that imply? They've had it before. If you're retrieving something, it's something you once had. So they've had that best place once before. For nothing keeps the order it received. That is, the order here can mean structure, its place in a hierarchy, or it can just mean its created state, except its rising to its fall, it bend, and make itself a circle without end. What does that mean, its rising to its fall, it bend? Well, I think the fall there refers to what happened, I could be wrong, refers to what happened in the Christian story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, the nature of all creation, the entire universe changed, okay? The animal world today is not what it was or what it was meant to be when, um, when it was first created, okay? So, except it's rising to its fall, it then. So, that means unless it rises to the place from which it first fell. So, what has to happen? The idea is that we, we start off up here, or, or, you know, reality starts up here, and then humanity falls down here and everything with it, all of the nature. And so now what must it do? It's got to rise back to that place of falling. That is, it's got to get back to its, her language, original home. Okay. So everything seeks ultimately its purpose and fulfillment because its purpose is what fulfills it. It's reason for being, the reason for which it was created. <clears throat> Pause for a second. So she goes on, book three, and says, um, you earthly creatures, you also dream of your origin. However faint the vision, you do have some sort of notion, unclear as it is, of the true goal of happiness. And so an instinctive sense of direction actually guides you towards the true good. Only various errors lead you astray. So she says something inborn in us tells us, you know, kind of where we ought to be going. But then we get distracted, right? Um, this ties back earlier to... Uh, in the consolation, when Lady Philosophy tells Boethius that he's forgotten who he is and where his home is. Page 52. For example. Um, she says... Let's see here. She asks Boethius, 
In the midst of all that great store of wealth, was your mind never troubled by worry arising from a feeling that something was wrong? He says, he says yes, I was never free from some sort of worry. And she says, and that was because, that was either because something was missing which you didn't want to be missing, or because something was present which you would have preferred not to have been present, right? Something was missing which you wanted or lacked, or you had something that you didn't want to have, okay? And the something missing part, it's kind of like what the rock group U2 gets at with their song, you know, that has the lyrics, I still haven't found what I've been looking for, right? Um, and then she's gonna go on, and it's also, I should say, it's like, um, we didn't read it because we had to cut it out. What St. Augustine talks about in the Confessions. In the Confessions, he says at one point, I, I don't remember exactly where, that he came to this realization that he was missing something. And he was trying to fill that hole in his life with sensual pleasures. He apparently got around quite a bit in his youth, sleeping around. Okay? He tried to fill it with sex. And he came to the realization, sex isn't doing it. It's, it's not giving him the happiness he sought, okay? So she says, now if, if something is lacking, a man must be lacking something if he misses it, right? And he says, well, yeah. And you felt this insufficiency even when you had wealth, he said, yeah. So she said, so wealth itself, cannot be the thing that you're missing, because even when you had wealth, you were still missing it. He says, yeah. Page 53. She says, wealth which was thought to make a man self-sufficient, in fact, makes him, makes him dependent on outside help. In which case, what is the way in which riches remove want? Okay. She's saying, how can wealth, how can riches remove want, want their meaning lack, okay? If when you have wealth and riches, you seemingly need still something more. And it's not necessarily you need something more in terms of more wealth, etc. You know, what is one of the things you need, supposedly, if you are a wealthy person? You need a bank? You need someplace to store the wealth? What else might you need? You might need guards to help protect it. Why might you want to protect it so that it's not taken away? And there's the problem. The, the lack is security. The wealth doesn't buy you the security you think you need because you're thinking somebody else might try to steal it and such. And she makes this wonder, wonderful statement. Nothing satisfies greed, right? Because the greedy person always wants more. So that if, so far from being able to remove want, riches create a want of their own, there is no reason for you to believe that they confer self-sufficiency. And it's kind of interesting because at the end of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the first book, I alluded to this the other day in one of the previous lectures. Harry's talking with Albus Dumbledore. He's having his end of year kind of debriefing that he has in most of the books. And they're talking about the Philosopher's Stone, which, very big in the Middle Ages, which was something that if you had it, you could use it to create the elixir of immortality that if you drank repeatedly, you would live forever. And it, you could also use it to turn base metal into gold. You could turn transform lead to gold for example, okay? That was its, its kind of surface base, most common value, let's say, of the Philosopher's Stone. The real alchemists, and I'm not praising alchemy as a brand of science or anything like that. I'm just saying the real goal of the real alchemists was self-transformation. It wasn't physical immortality. It was spiritual immortality. And it wasn't turning base metal into gold, it was turning base persons into 
golden persons. It was the transformation from impure, sinful people to pure, sinless people, okay? So, after Dumbledore makes the comment that I read the other day, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure, he makes this statement. As much money in life as you could want, the two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Now think about that statement for a minute. Dumbledore says, humans have a knack for choosing the things that are worst for them. And he does it in the context of talking about as much money and life as you could want. <coughs> so if as much money and life as you could want are the two worst things that humans could want, what would be the two best things? Wouldn't it be the two opposites? As much life? Does that mean no life? Are you talking suicide? Poverty? Interesting. Or is he suggesting the desire to save one's life? is not the best thing in the world. The desire to preserve one's life as long as we can. Because in the rest of the series, we're going to see, if you read the, the books, there's an emphasis on the good death, the right kind of death, okay? What did Dumbledore say? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So if you have the right mindset, death is not to be feared. So maybe there are times when death is to, pre to be preferred over continued life. And I don't mean death suicide. I mean, maybe he is suggesting there are some things that are worth dying for. So the the life and wealth thing, this could be a biblical allusion to Christ, for example, he would seek his life must lose his life. He who would you know, find his life must do what? Take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And to take up his cross and deny himself, there you've got both elements. Death and the absence of riches death and the giving away of riches, right? She goes on. Um, Lady Philosophy does, page 54, okay? She talks about high office. She's, kind of get, she's going to kind of go through those elements or those things that humanity thinks will bring them happiness, okay? So she's talked about wealth now. Wealth won't do it. Now she talks about high office, because what can high office supposedly bring? Honor and respect, right? Does it? Not necessarily. She makes the point, it's not the office that holds the honor and respect. What is it? It's the person who holds the office. In other words, you have to be worthy of honor and respect before you hold the office because we've seen offices, positions of power in history where the people who hold those positions of power are horrible, okay? A lot of people today in the United States, you know, roughly half the, half the population would say President Trump is not worthy of the office of president because of his behavior, right? The other half would say the opposite, would say, you know, he's the first president in years to actually do what he said he was going to do, fulfill his promises and such. I mean, you've got elected offices around the world where we know, and sometimes unelected offices, where we know the person who holds that office is just rotten, just a scoundrel, okay? So high office does not confer 
honor and respect because it can be held by someone who's evil. Think who held the highest office in the land when Boethius is writing this? Theodoric. A king ought to be good. Theodoric wasn't, right? And Theodoric, by the way, is held out in other Germanic, Germanic words as a model of an evil king, okay? What else? Skip over a bit, pages 56 and 57 in chapter five, okay? So now it's, we've moved from high office to holding power because the high office isn't, that's not about the power part. That's about the honor and respect that it can give to the person who holds the office, right? Now we're talking about holding a position of power and the two positions she specifically refers to are the office of king or a friend of the king, right? If you remember Oedipus the king, what did Crayon say to Oedipus? Why would I want your job? Why would I plot against you? When I have all the powers of the king without any of the headaches, I don't have to make any of the decisions you do, right? So she says, kingship or friendship, it's not true power either. That is friendship to the king, close connections to the king. Why? Because those who hold those jobs, king or friend of the king, often what? Why is Boethius in prison? Because Theodoric has been told that Boethius was plotting against him. Kings often fear that they will lose their power and be replaced by somebody else. Friends of kings, what can happen to them? Boethius is our example. They can very quickly become unfriends of kings. They, you know, use the Facebook image. They can be unfriended <laughs> and cast into prison. Okay? So that kind of power doesn't really confer happiness because you're always thinking. What, what happens when I lose? That's, you know, that's part of the genius of the American system. What do we know is going to happen every four years? There will be a presidential election. Every four years, there is the possibility of throwing the president out or electing a new president, however, whichever way you want to put it. So if you get tired of the president, however many more years there are, get them out. Okay, so, you know, mind-blowing experiment in human history that the founders came up with. Okay, so what else? Skip a few more pages and go on to page 59. Let's see here. Where she talks about, top of the page, claims of nobility. This is getting at to, to the notion of respect. That should be, notion of fame. Fame for what? Fame for your family name. What are some important slash significant slash at one point or another well-respected political dynastic names in the United States? Who's, who should be the first one to come to mind? Kennedy's. Okay. Yeah, JFK, his father, the senator. Okay. His brother, the senator, his brother, the attorney general, and then sons who became politicians and nephews. There's currently still a, a uh, politician in the Congress who's a Kennedy, right? Who else? The Bushes, two presidents, father, son, another, you know, governor, et cetera, you know, another one kind of rising through the ranks and in the Texas political scene today. So what's his point? Or what's Lady Philosophy's point? You aren't deserving of fame according to who you're related to. And that's what she's talking about, nobility. Nobility here means this idea of what are called patents of nobility. If you ever saw A Knight's Tale okay, with um, Heath Ledger, it was all about this idea that 
who you were born to determines your worth in life. And this is a very, very medieval idea. Classical medieval idea. Okay? I mentioned before, you know, Boethius was born into a very famous family. Here's Spain, right? She says, your family history, your family heredity ultimately means nothing, right? And Chaucer, about 850, 800, yeah, 850, 870 years after Boethius, um, writes the, con um, the Canterbury Tales. And in the Canterbury Tales, you've got the wife of Bath's tale. And the wife of Bath's tale, which is short compared to the rest of the wife of Bath's part, is all about this idea of what is true or real nobility. And she makes the point through this Arthurian story that she tells about rape, that your family name means nothing in terms of real nobility. The word she uses is gentilesse, G-E-N-T-I-L-L-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, gentilesse, right? She says real gentilesse comes about by behavior, by what's inside. Because this person that she's talking about, this knight who claims, you know, his great family name and all this kind of stuff, well, he, he raped a woman, okay? And in the wife's tale, this woman berates him. After she marries him, she's an old hag and all this kind of stuff. Um, she berates him because he's still appealing to his family fame and all that kind of stuff. And she says, you know, our real fame comes from our being made in the image of God. We're all children of God, she says, and that's the source of our real glory, or to use the, language, the word that's used here, our real nobility, right? And she says at the end of that paragraph at the top of the page, uh, page 59, if there is anything good in nobility, I think it is only, the, only this, that there is a necessary condition imposed upon the noble not to fall short of the virtue of their ancestors. She's essentially saying, you know, if, if there is any nobility conferred upon you, it's what? You should live up to your name rather than just writing on your name, okay? And then we get the little poem. From one beginning rises all mankind. For one Lord rules and fathers all things born. Skipping a couple lines. He closed in bodies, minds brought down from high, a noble origin for mortal men. That is, our minds, souls, came from heaven and were put into the bodies we have. Why then proclaim your kin and ancestry? Your kin and ancestry have all to do with the body. She says, the mind, the soul, has nothing to do with that. Look whence you came and see who made you. God. No man is base. That means low, demeaned. Except through sin. He quit his proper source to cherish meaner things. The only thing that makes you base, <coughs> excuse me, that makes humans base or low is to choose sin over God. Right? Another way of putting that is to choose to turn one's face away from God, if this is God over here, to look at the apples. Think of the Garden of Eden story. God's here. The apple tree's here. Where did it come down? All right. Chapter 7, she goes on to talk about bodily pleasure. And notice what she says. I've got a little bit to say about it. Hold on just one second. I'm going to pull up. Poem. Its pursuit is full of anxiety and fulfillment full of remorse. Full of anxiety. 
you're nervous, you look forward to it, you're wondering how I'm going to get it, it being the bodily pleasure, okay? But once it's achieved, you look back on it, on the fulfillment of the pleasure with remorse. This is Shakespeare's sonnet 129. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And there's puns going on there. Waste, meaning an expense, you know, a, a throwing away of, but it can also mean waste, like the waste of a body. Well, where one's genitalia are, is lust in action. Until action, that is, until it's performed, Lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Enjoyed no sooner, that is, once that lust is fulfilled, it's immediately despised. Past reason hunted. People will do irrational things to fulfill their bodily lusts. In the lust, here specifically, it's referring to sex. It can be other things. It can be cigarettes, it can be booze, it can be drugs. Past reason hunted, no sooner had, past reason hated. Got out of your mind hating it. As a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad at pursuit, mad at possession. So had, having, and in possession so. Uh, had, having, and a quest to have extreme. A bliss in proof that is when you are fulfilling that lust, it's an exquisite pleasure and proved, once it's done, a very low. Before a joy proposed, because a joy proposed, the joy that you're looking forward to is always one. It's always, oh man, I wish I could have this. Behind a dream. What's the difference between the two? A dream is not something you can hold on to. You wake up from it for you go, no, no, no. All this the world will know, yet none knows well to shun the heaven the lust that leads men to hell. Right? Um, let's see here. Go on. Uh, chapter eight. Okay, page 61. He talks about the vault of heaven. Excuse me, she talks about the vault of heaven. It says, see the strength of the foundation, speed of its movement. Stop admiring things that are worthless. What she means is, look up to the sky. And this is kind of a reference to the whole Ptolemaic conception that we began with. The heavens are less wonderful for their foundation and speed than for the order that rules them. She's saying, look at the order out there. Everything works like clockwork. She says, don't admire things that are worth, but where are the things that are worthless? The things down here that are always changing, that are haphazard, right? One is 62. You got a long footnote there about the, the Ptolemaic conception. Okay, so you can kind of use the, the diagram I drew in connection with this. Page 62, she says, the sum of all this, all this what? All this that she's been talking about, all these earthly pleasures and means of seeking happiness is that they can neither produce the good they promise nor come to perfection by the combination of all good. That is, if you get as much as you want of wealth, it's not going to produce the good that you seek, nor by a combination of all of these things are you going to get the good you seek. These things are not the way to happiness and cannot by themselves make people happy. She doesn't assert that they don't bring any happiness. She asserts they don't fulfill the desire or the seeking for happiness and the good. 
They give little bits of good. They don't give the whole good or the entire good. And as such, they only whet the appetite more. But if you just try to fulfill the appetite's desires with more of these little pieces, you don't get the, the whole thing, okay? And she says in the poem, Alas, what wretched ignorance leads mankind from the path astray. Notice it's ignorance. It's not knowing what leads mankind astray off the path. It's kind of like, it's kind of like humanity has ADHD. We're on the path. We're making the right way. Ooh, a bunny. And psh, ooh, a shiny thing. Psh, and we go off that direction. Towards the end of the poem, about eight lines up. In their blindness, they do not know where lies the good they seek. Notice, in their blindness, because we're blind, that's why we don't know where the good is that we seek. That which is, so where's the good? That which is higher than the sky, on earth below they seek. Okay? That's kind of, again, the platonic image of the allegory of the cave. The good is out here way up here we seek it where down here it's like we're we're walking around like hamlet with our eyes focused on the ground and we need to learn to, to, to look up Ooh, there's a beautiful image in the last book of the ab Porson series um not the prequels, the last book of the original trilogy. A character dies. These are by Garth Nix. Highly recommend them. Fantasy literature. A character dies and he goes through what are called the gates of death. There are nine gates. Okay? He enters the ninth gate, which means he can never go back to the world of the living. If you go only through the eighth gate, eight gates, you can, you can always come back. You'll never be like you were but you can come back in a really crappy form. You go past the ninth gate, you can't go back. But you may not go all the way on. What you have to do to go all the way on is you have to look upwards. And I hadn't thought about that before. And what you see when you look upwards is all the stars. What you see when you look down is this this water that flows through death, okay? And it's kind of, and, and I hadn't thought about that before. You know, when you look down, you, you, you're still in the, in this place. When characters go through and they look up, they have an experience of bliss. Very, very interesting, okay? So, that which is higher than the sky on earth below they seek, bottom of page 62. What can I wish you foolish men? That is, what can I wish for you? Wealth and fame pursue, and when great toil wins false reward, then may you seek the true. In his poem, and I forgot to look this one up. The Pulley by George Herbert. Herbert writes, When God at first made man, having a glass of blessing, blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, that is, the whole wealth of the world, which dispersed life, contract into a span. So strength first made a way. Then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was gone, done, uh, when almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rests in the bottom lay. So think of this as when God is pouring all the treasure of the world out. So he pours and pours and pours and pours. And just before he empties the bottle, God stops. 
Why? Because what is in the rest is the rest, okay, of God's blessings, but it is also rest, peace, contentment, satisfaction, all right? For if I should, said he, God, bestow this jewel, rest, perfect contentment and satisfaction, also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me, and rest in nature, not the God of nature, so both should losers be. Man would be a loser, why? Because he would have no awareness or desire for God. God would be a loser because he would not have man's worship. Yet let him keep the rest, that is everything I've already given to him, strength, power, beauty, you know, but let keep, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary that at least if goodness lead him not virtue, yet weariness may toss him to my rest. Weariness, tiredness of this world. Look at again what he said, what Lady Philosophy says. And when great toil wins false reward, then may you see the true. The true what? The true reward. The true rest that we seek. The true thing that fills the gaping hole that St. Augustine said each person has. The thing that you two and Bono sing when they say, I still haven't found what I'm searching for where he talks about singing with the voices of angels and being, you know, on the ocean and climbing mountains and experiencing love. And all those things are wonderful in and of themselves, but they're not what fulfill deep inside, right? Then we get to chapter nine. Chapter nine, book three, is the exact middle of the entire book. So it's really important, right? And she says, Lady Philosopher does, um, I've said enough to give a picture of false happiness. And if you can see that clearly, the next thing is to show you what true happiness is. And he says, yeah, I get that. And she says, okay, do you get the reasons for this? And she says, I get a glimmer, but maybe you should spell it out. The reason is very clear. That which is one and undivided is mistakenly subdivided and remove my men from the state of truth and perfection to a state of falseness in imperfection, right? Do you consider self-sufficiency as a state deficient? He says, no. Okay, so she says, the thing that is one unity and undivided unity is mistakenly subdivided, okay? from the state of truth and perfection to a state of falseness and imperfection. So she has to start talking about self-sufficiency and such, right? So she says, so self-sufficiency, being complete in oneself and power are one and the same nature. She said, yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay, so a being of this kind would be beneath contempt, right? Or worthy of veneration, he goes, yeah, right? So then let's add to the state of being revered to sufficiency of power that we may judge all three to be one. He says, okay, so what do you think then would the combination be, would such a combination be unrecognized and unknown or famous and renowned? Granted, it lacks nothing, with this being that she's talking about, it lacks nothing, it's self-sufficient, it possesses all power, and it's supremely worthy of honor. So, if it had those three things, would it lack any kind of glory and be deserving qualified merit? And he says, no, it would be unsurpassed in fame and glory, right? So she then asked, top of 64, if there were then, hold on, a being self-sufficient, able to accomplish everything from its own resources, glorious and worthy of reverence, surely it would also be supremely happy. And he said, well, yeah. And for the same reason, this conclusion too, top of 64, middle 64, is inescapable. Sufficiency, power, glory, reverence, happiness differ in name, 
but not in substance. Not in substance, not in essence. These are all qualities of this being. He says, yes. She then says, human perversity then makes divisions of that, which by nature is one and simple. That is, self-sufficiency, power, glory, reverence, happiness. And in attempting to obtain part of something, which has no parts, part of something, self-sufficiency, or power, or glory, or being worthy of veneration, okay, succeeds in getting neither the part, each of those individual things, which is nothing without the whole, nor the whole, which they are not interested in. All right? Do, do you get that? Do you understand the point she's making? If there is a being or a thing, that is entirely self-sufficient. And maybe another way of thinking of self-sufficiency is, is the word independent. Dependent means what? It hangs. Like, for example, well, I can use these. These glasses are dependent. How so? Well, they are pendant. That means hanging. But they are dependent, how? Because they are hanging from what? Ultimately, in this case, from my finger. Because if I do that, they're no longer dependent. They're no longer hanging, pendant, and they're no longer hanging from my finger, okay? So they are totally dependent on that. So go from that image to the word independent. In just means un. Name something that does not depend, hang from, anything else. I am not dependent, excuse me, I am not independent. How so? What do I hang from? Around me, you can kind of see them. There's one. I have lights shining. I am dependent on that light right now to make enough light for you to be able to see me. What else am I dependent on? I am dependent on TVA for generating the electricity to power that light. I am dependent on Target for selling this shirt that I'm wearing. I am dependent upon the friend of mine who built this house for me. I am dependent on Kroger and Publix and Sam's Club and the other places I shop for the food that I purchase. Okay. I'm dependent upon the United States government for protection from foreign adversaries. I am dependent upon the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office, somewhat, to protect me from harm. And I am dependent upon my parents because they brought me into being. And they were dependent upon their parents. We could go all the way back. Right? None of us is independent. So imagine something that is independent. It would be somebody or something that does not rely on anybody else for anything. Well, there's a, defin there's a word that fits that definition. That would be God. That beyond, and she's going to use this language, that beyond which one cannot think. You can't go beyond God. You can't think of something higher than God. Okay? And part of the definition of God is that which is totally independent. Now, a couple of things I want to um, refer to here. One, when she talks about, you know, the, lost my place, the unity and such
okay, of all these things. It's very similar to two different passages in J.R.R. Tolkien. In his essay on fairy stories, which I highly, highly recommend, it applies to literature, not just fairy stories. In that essay, he includes part of a poem that he wrote that he wrote and sent to a friend. And the poem is titled Mythopoeia, by the way. And in it, he talks about God. Okay? And he says, Dear sir, although now long estranged, man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, that is not dethroned, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. Man, sub creator, that is beneath, it means kind of junior creator, the reflect the reflected light through whom is splintered from a single white in many hues, too many hues, and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Right? He's saying, God is the white light. And we are refractions. How so? The notion we've talked about earlier of humanity, individuals being made in the image of God. Now, Tolkien, through his language here, is kind of taking that in a different direction. He's saying God is the white light, and each individual is a particular color on the entire spectrum which is mind-blowing if you think about it. Because if, if, if you take that idea, and if you were to, to, let's say, accept it or believe it, what does that mean? It means each time somebody dies, a little bit of that spectrum poof, is also gone, okay? That's one image that Tolkien uses. Another one is, i to find a book, in... The Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf is relating his capture by Saruman. This is in the Council of Elrond. And Saruman points out that he's no longer Saruman the White. He's now Saruman of many colors. All right. Let's see. And on page 259 in the one volume edition, Gandalf relates, I looked then and saw that his robes, which had seemed white, were not so, but were woven of all colors. And if he moved, they shimmered and changed hue, so that the eye was bewildered. I liked white better, I said. White, he sneered. It serves as a beginning. White cloth may be dyed. The white page can be overwritten. And the white light can be broken. In which case it is no longer white, said I. And he that breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. Right? Look again at what Lady Philosophy said. Human perversity, leaving the path of wisdom, makes divisions of that which by nature is one and simple. And in attempting to obtain part of something which has no parts. In other words, she's saying human perversity does what? We want those godlike qualities, but we want them how? Piecemeal. We think it's like a smorgasbord or cafeteria. I can choose this, and I can choose this, and I can choose this, and I can choose this. And she's saying, mm -mm. It's the whole enchilada or nothing. You want those qualities? You have to draw closer to them. You can't pull them to you. That is, you have to go closer to the source of them. Okay? So, she goes on and says, okay. Pages 64 and 65, you know, we seek these things here below, wealth, self-sufficiency, power, ability, etc. right? We seek those things here below 
in Plato's cave, rather than outside in the real world where they should be sought. Right? So she asks at page 65, so if he's seeking the sum of happiness, the sum, the totality, but do you think he would find it among those things which we have shown to be unable to confer what they promise? Wealth, office, power, respect, fame? He says no. So it's, okay, so it's impossible, top of 65, to find happiness among these things which are thought to confer them here. He says, yes. Then there you have both the nature and the cause of false happiness. You have the nature of false happiness and you have the cause of false happiness. Why they don't fulfill. So she says, now turn your mind's eye in the opposite direction. Your mind's eye, not your literal physical eye, your mind's eye and you will immediately see the true happiness what I, that I promise. Well, what's the opposite direction? Well, what's the direction they've been looking or that she suggests humanity looks for happiness, the false happiness? Where is that sought? Here, okay, here. It's sought here in the particulars the individual things of this life. And I should make a point here. Huge difference between Socrates and Plato and Plato's student, Aristotle, is that Aristotle said we cannot really know what's up here. We cannot really know what's in the world of forms or ideals. He said the best we can do is we can walk around the world that we're in and look at all what are called the particulars, all the examples of stuff down here to try to mentally deduce what must be in that world of forms. So for example, back to this image, you look at all the bottles in the world to try to arrive at ultimate bottledness. You look at all the books in the world. You look at all pens in the world. You look at all shirts in the world to determine the essence of shirtness, etc. Okay. That's the particular approach. The other one is called the general or universal approach, Plato's approach, right? So, she says, mentally, with your mind's eye, turn around and go in the other direction. So what's the other direction? Well, we've been down here on Earth, so look upward, she says. Okay. And Boethius says, even a blind man can see it. And you revealed it just now. For unless I'm mistaken, true and perfect happiness is that which makes a man self-sufficient, strong, worthy of respect, glorious, and joyful. And then he says, and I can see that happiness to be true happiness. That is the thing that produces those things, that will be true happiness since they are all the same thing. And they can truly bestow any one of them. And she says, you're blessed, provided you had one more thing. That is, man, you are so close. You're almost there, Boethius. But what? What am I missing? What do I not see? So she asks the question. Notice she doesn't tell him. She never tells him. She asks him why this is the Socratic method. We're going to get to why the asking and not the telling in just a moment. Do you think there is anything among these mortal and degenerate things which could confer such a state? Anything down here among all the stuff in this world that could confer that state of true, perfect happiness? He says, no, no, you, you've clearly made certain that's not the case. She says, 
clearly, therefore, these things, the things that produce wealth, the things that produce, that give us high office, the things of power, fame, etc., offer man only, and we're back to the allegory of the cave, shadows of the true good, or imperfect blessings. You cannot confer true and perfect good. Okay, imperfect blessings. If they're imperfect, then they're missing what makes them perfect. They're shadows, they're not the true good. Okay, because can you touch a, sh a shadow? Can you take hold of a shadow? No. No. In Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, the character of Oberon is called King of Shadows. The fairies are, to the humans, insubstantial. They cannot be grasped, right? And he says, yes, I realize that. I see that, right? Page 66. So now she says, okay, so now that you see that, what remains now is for you to figure out where to see, excuse me, is that you should see where to find this true happiness. That's, that's all that's remaining. Where, it's, where does this true happiness lie? Okay. He says, yeah, and that's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> that's the, I still haven't found what I've been searching for thing. So she says, um, what do you think we ought to do now in order to be worthy of discovering the source of that supreme good? She asks him that question. And he says, we ought to pray to the father of all things. To omit to do so would not be laying a proper foundation. We ought to pray to God. For what? For illumination, for enlightenment, for direction, for aid. And she says, right. And she starts a hymn. Okay. Page 66, the poem. Unchain I'm skipping the first few lines. Unchanging mover, no cause drove thee to move excuse me, to mold unstable matter, but the form benign of highest good within thee set. That is, nothing prompted God to create. Just what was in him. In other words, God created why? Because God is a creator. God is the source. As the Protestant hymn says, from whom all blessings flow. All good things flow. St. James in his epistle says, God is the father of all lights and all good gifts. Right? She says, all things I'll bring us forth from thy high archetype. From yourself is what that means. Thou height of beauty, in thy mind the beauteous world does bear, and in that ideal likeness sheep, there's that word ideal, the world of forms. Well, where is that? It's God's mind. According to Platonic doctrine, as Lady Philosophy is kind of qualifying it here, the ideal bottle is God's idea of bottle. And what we're doing, what we've been doing, we humanity, for thousands of years in creating bottles, it's kind of like we're still trying to get it right. Okay? She says, in thy mind, the beauteous world does bear, and in that ideal likeness, shaping it, does order perfect parts a whole to frame. And everything that we see around us are parts of the whole. Right? And under the end of the poem, on page 67. Grandfather, that our minds thy august seat may scan. August means high, exalted. May scan. We can catch a glimpse of it. Doesn't mean penetrate to the depth of it. Grant us the sight of true good source and grant us light that we may fix on thee our minds unblinded eye. Grant 
us light. Why? Because it was the thought at the time that our eyes produce light, that our eyes shot out beams of light. So grant us the internal light so that we can see your, see you. Disperse the clouds of earthly matters, cloying weight. Cloying means like clumping together. Earthly, the dirt, the muck, the such and such of earth that does what? Drags us down. Shine out in all thy glory, for thou art rest and peace to those who worship thee, to see thee is our end, who art our source and maker, Lord and path and goal. Notice, to see thee is our end. That doesn't mean conclusion. That's one meaning. But that's not even the major meaning. The major meaning is to see thee is our purpose. That's why we live, right? Another illusion. Hold on a second. When she says, Disperse the clouds of earthly matters, cloying weight, shine out in all thy glory. Gerard Manley Hopkins, God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Another word for grandeur would be like glory. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Wreck means consider, think about. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And where is man's smudge and shares man's smell? The soil is bare now, for nor can foot feel being shod. The, the speaker is saying, the world, God is still present in the world, but we don't pay any attention to it. We've covered it over and we've turned everything into economic, you know, transaction. And for all this, that is, and despite all this, nature is never spent. It's never wasted. It's never totally gone. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went when the sun totally sets, the morning at the brown brink eastward springs. And what he's suggesting there is, even when it looks the darkest, metaphorically, light is always coming up. Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. Hopkins is saying in that poem that we can see some of that glory in the things around us. Some, it's an indication to look harder, to seek out the source, to find where it shines out in all thy glory, okay? So that's why the, she then goes on and says, to see thee is our end, who art our source and maker, Lord and path and goal, okay? Chapter 10. Uh, Let's see here. Okay. She says in the second paragraph, but the existence of this good and its function as a kind of fountainhead of all good things cannot be denied. For everything that is said to be imperfect is held to be so by the absence of perfection. Now that's just logic. If you're going to use the word imperfect, what does it imply? That there's a perfect. The M is the prefix to make it unperfect. The very word unperfect implies there must be perfection. So the very word unfair implies what? There's a standard of fairness. C.S. Lewis talks about this in the middle, I think it is of his book, Mere Christianity, right? So, 
if a certain imperfection is visible in any class of things, it follows there is also a proportion of perfection in it. So if you have something that is imperfect, that implies it kind of points to the perfection. It doesn't have the perfection in and of itself. If you do away with perfection, it is impossible to imagine how that which is held to be imperfect could exist. Notice the logic and the reason. We couldn't talk about this world isn't fair and there must not be a God because it's unfair. That's, un that's illogical. The very fact that we say this world is unfair implies there must be some source of fairness okay, that cannot be in this world. It, it, it cannot just come from us. So there's something outside of us, she is suggesting, that creates this notion of fairness. All right? The natural world did not take its origin from that which was impaired and incomplete. It issues from that which is unimpaired and perfect. Okay. Next page, 69. It is the universal, under, now that, keep in mind, this is in 523. It is the universal understanding of the human mind that God, the author of all things, is good. That is, she's suggesting Plato said God was good. Socrates said God was good. Uh, even Aristotle, who talks about God solely as the prime mover. He doesn't talk about God as a personal being, so to speak, right? Who one can pray to and such. And she says, since nothing can be conceived better than God, everyone agrees, that which has no superior is good. And by that, what she's suggesting is, philosophy says, that if there is something that is so high that nothing else is highest of it, it must be also the highest good, the summum bonum. Because, again, philosophy, existence in and of itself is good. It is a positive thing. What's the absence? What's the opposite of existence? Nothingness. So existence is a positive. It's a plus. It's a bonus. Therefore, the highest existence, beyond which nothing can be thought, must be the highest good. Okay? Have to bear in mind, within the Christian tradition, God does not exist in the same way that we exist because of that notion she's talked about earlier, self-sufficiency. Okay. Um, so she says, you know, therefore he's the author of creation. We can't be anything higher than that. Get down to the end of that paragraph, page 69. Therefore, to avoid an unending argument, it must be admitted, that is, we have to take this as an axiom. You know, kind of like um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, an inalienable truth or an inalienable right. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That's an axiom. It's a truth that cannot be debated, right? It must be admitted the supreme good is to the highest degree filled with supreme and perfect goodness. But we have agreed that perfect good is true happiness so that it follows true happiness, supreme happiness, total happiness is to be found in the supreme God. Boethi says, yep, I get it. Right. Page 70. She says, so on the basis of that, and she offered a few more statements, we've agreed that supreme good is the same as happiness. He says, yes, bottom of page 70. So we have to agree that God is the essence of happiness. God is the essence of goodness. God is the essence of power. God is the essence of glory. God is the essence of worthy of veneration, right? God is the essence of happiness. And he agrees. She says, okay. 
So we deduced, top of the next page, bottom of the first long paragraph, we deduced that both happiness and God are supreme goodness. To be supremely happy is to be supremely good. Okay? So that it follows, supreme happiness is identical with supreme divinity, because you can't get any divinity higher than God. And he says, yeah, that's logical. So, middle of the next paragraph. Since it is through the possession of happiness that people become happy, right? You've got to receive happiness in order to become happy. So yet you kind of own it, you possess it. And since happiness is in fact divinity, okay, it's clear it's, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? If it's, if the possession of happiness makes people happy, A equals B. And if happiness is in fact divinity, B equals C, then through the possession of happiness, A, one becomes divine, C. But by the same logic as men become just through the possession of justice or wise through the possession of wisdom, so those who possess divinity become necessarily divine. And if any of you are Protestant Christians, this might be kind of difficult for you. I used to be Protestant. I'm now Eastern Orthodox, like Russian and Greek and Bulgarian Orthodox and such. I was Protestant for a long time, was really, really Reformed, Presbyterian, Calvinistic, etc. Now I'm not that at all, right? And this kind of, this relates kind of to why. So she goes on. While God is only so, while only God is so by nature. That is, only God is divine by nature, by his essence, by his isness, by what he is in himself as many as you like as many people as you like or as you want or as you can think of may become so may become so what divine by participation how participation possession of happiness if you possess happiness you possess divinity if you possess divinity, you participate in God. What is she talking about? And notice how Boethius responds, because it's pretty interesting. He says, what you say is beautiful and valuable, whether you give it the Greek or the Latin name. The Greek, keep in mind, before he held these high offices, he wanted to spend his life translating Aristotle and Plato from Greek into Latin. So he was a master of Greek. The Greek term for what they're talking about is theosis, T-H-E-O-S-I-S, -S, right? Divinization, being made God-like, okay? Second Peter, New Testament, see, I've got it over here somewhere. Let me change my version. Second Peter one verses three to four. Peter's writing and says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Okay. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. What are the promises? So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Okay, what does that mean? You may participate in, you may become part of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And that's why Peter then goes on and says, for this reason, that is because 
so that you might become a participator in the divine nature. Make every effort to add to your faith, your belief, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, love. In other words, all of these virtues, all of these things will help you become more and more and more like God. Also look at 2 Corinthians 3.18, where Paul writes, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, as in a glass is like through glasses or through a mirror, if you want, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He says, changed into the same image. If you look at the book of, hold on a second. The book of Hebrews. <clears throat> opens this way. God, who at sundry times and in, device, in, and in diverse manners spake in time past upon, excuse me, let me start over. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Quote, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, unquote, right? He is the exact image of the Father. That is not a copy. And what St. Paul said in Corinthians is those who believe, those who are Christians and such, are made by how do they put it? By beholding the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. And the way that one of the early church fathers, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, puts that is that from glory to glory is that for all eternity, those individuals are becoming more and more and more and more like God. They're becoming deeper participants by grace, not by nature. Only God is God by nature. Everybody else has the opportunity to become God-like by grace, okay? But notice how it happens through actions, through choices, through virtue, by the, living a virtuous life. That's why, back to Boethius, she says, page 71, while only God is so by nature, as many as you like may become so by participation. And he says, that's beautiful and valuable, whether you use the Greek term or the Latin term. The Greek term theosis, the Latin term participation, which is the English form of the Latin term, right? And she says, but the most beautiful thing is what logic leads us to add to all this. That is, Take the next mental step, okay? And she asks the question and he responds. And um, she says, top of page 72, the question is this, all these things, sufficiency, power, the others, you know, all these things, are they good as if happiness were a body of which they were members? Or is goodness superordinate to which they belong? Okay. Are all these things, sufficiency, power, fame, etc., are they good as if happiness was somehow connected to them? Or is goodness above them? Okay. She then goes on. They talk a little bit more, and she says, the chief point in reason, therefore, for seeking all things is goodness. That is, these things, sufficiency, power, glory, etc., 
They are what? They are things that, let's put it this way, depend from goodness. They hang from goodness. They are aspects. The result is, therefore, bottom of page 72. Hold on, I'm checking my notes for anything. The result is, therefore, that there is justice in the belief that goodness is the chief point upon which the pursuit of everything hinges and by which it is motivated. What seems most to be desired is the thing that motivates the pursuit of something. That is the thing that spurs it on. So, so why, why is it you want power? Why is it you want sufficiency, etc.? cetera? Um, what seems most to be desired is the thing that motivates the pursuit of something. As for example, if a man wants to go riding for the sake of health, it is not so much the motion of horse riding, but the health that he wants. Since, therefore, all things are desired for the sake of the good in them, no one desires them as much as the good itself. That is, they don't desire power just for power. They desire it for the good that is in power, etc. Right? So, she concludes, top of 73, it is patently obvious that the good itself and happiness are identical. So the good is identical to happiness, which is identical to God. And Boethius says, yep. Lady philosophy, we have shown God and happiness are one and the same. Yes, we may safely conclude then that God is to be found in goodness itself and nowhere else. And then we get the poem. And the poem concludes with, Wealth in its own darkness clouds the thoughts. For all that thus excites and charms the mind, dim earth has fostered in her caverns deep. And that's probably an allusion to the allegory of the cave. While that bright light which rules and animates the sky will shun such dark and ruined souls. Whoever once shall see this shining light will say the sun's own rays are not so bright. What's that shining light? The light of truth, the light of God. So once you perceive that light, the summum bonum, sun's rays aren't really anything. Why? They're the poor copy. Doesn't mean you can look at them and not be blinded. It means intellectually, okay? Um, chapter 11. Let's see, page 74. She asks, Boethius, how valuable would you think if you could come to know the good itself? Look at Boethius's response. Infinitely valuable, infinitely. If I should also be able to see God who is the good. Now, I don't know, I'm not positive, but I'm gonna suggest a possibility here. I think there's a pun there. How valuable would it be? Infinitely valuable. Why? Because I'd be able to see God, and God is what? Infinite. The value would keep growing more and more and more and more. It would get greater and greater and greater and greater. Just like St. Paul said back in 2 Corinthians, we would go, those who see God, those who you know, attain this state, would go from glory to glory to glory to glory. Like this peeling off of layer after layer after layer and getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, okay, into the God like essence. Okay. Um, let's see. Page 75, she says something else that I originally was going to talk about Gandalf in the white light because it, it kind of applies. She says at the end of the first long paragraph, you may run through every other thing and it will be clear beyond a shadow of doubt 
that everything subsists. That is, everything exists as long as it is one, but perishes when its unity ceases. Think of, again, of what Gandalf said in that passage. He said, in response to Sarah Man saying, the white page can be overwritten, the white light can be broken. Gandalf, in which case it is no longer white. If you take the white page and white, write on it, it's not white anymore. If you take the white light and break it, it's not white anymore, right? She says, when you remove the unity of something, you no longer have the thing. When you take from, let's say, God, the power that is part of God's nature, and try to find the shadow, the image of that power down here, You don't really have it, okay? You don't have the complete thing. Um, let's go on, We're almost done. Because this finishes in just a few more pages. Okay, page 77. She says, um, top of the page. Now, whatever seeks to subsist and remain alive, like us, you know, eating, drinking, etc., animals, desires to be one. What do you mean it desires to be one? Well, a human, let's take, say within the Boethian context, a human is what? Body and soul, right? So if you seek to subsist, that means to continue living, you want to remain one, right? You want to remain body and soul. What do you have when you have a body without a soul, a human body without a soul? You have a corpse. What if you have a soul wandering around without a body? You have a ghost, neither of which is human, right? You see a person who's dead. You know, my dad's going to die sometime in the next, you know, it could be immediately to four weeks. When he is dead, okay, my belief system says what remains behind, what, what we put in the coffin I built for him will not be Richard Sherman. It will be the body of Richard Sherman. The Richard Sherman will be elsewhere, just as when my mom died and we put her body in the coffin I built for her, Kathy Sherman wasn't there anymore, okay? So if it seeks to go on living and remain alive, it has to be one. Take unity away from a thing and existence to ceases. Ooh, and I hadn't thought of this either. I have another reference later on to Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort, without giving too much away for those you haven't read it. And if you haven't read it, it's probably too late anyways. Um, Lord Voldemort does some things to his soul because he wants to make himself immortal. He doesn't go after the right path for immortality, however. He splits his soul and puts it in things like this phone, in this bottle. He puts it in seven things. He accidentally does it, means, means to put it in six things. He accidentally does it and splits it into eight, okay? Um, but as he does, his physical features change. Why? Because he's no longer whole. And we hear in, in one of the books, somebody says, you know, the soul is supposed to remain whole and inviolate. Okay? And in a sense, Lord Voldemort, when he does his horcruxes, he, as a unified whole, ceases to exist. Why? Because now part of him is over here, part of him is over here. He's no longer the sum. Okay. Wuthia says, yep, true. Okay, so everything desires unity. Yep. And we prove unity is identical with goodness. He says, uh, yeah. So, 
she concludes. Notice these are questions, essentially. So all things seek the good, which you could describe by saying that it is goodness itself which all things desire. He says, yes. If there is something to which all things are inclined, it will be the sum of all good. She says, good job, good job. You have revealed, middle of 77, the very thing you were just now saying you did not know. And that was what the end of all things was. The end, the purpose, right? He just said, the thing to which all things are inclined is the sum of all good. What does that verb inclined mean? Think of this phone, try to get it lined up here. The phone is upright. Now it's inclined. See, this way, it's just like this, right? This way, it's at an incline. That is, it starts this way, and it moves up at an angle. What is he, what is she suggesting? Everything bends toward what? What was one of the major things that came about as a result of the discovery of gravity? Part of, part of you know, Einstein's brilliance. Space is curved. How so? Space-time continuum. See, here you have, let, let's say here's space right here. Or no, take this one. Here's space, and you drop a planet right here. What does it do? It bends, got to get my hands right, around the planet. Gravity bends space and time. Einstein's theory, general theory of relativity teaches us, okay? She says, goodness is the thing to which all things incline. They lean towards, and they lean towards it because they're pulled to it, all right? So, 77, the last paragraph. When he says, what was that again? The, 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 what I didn't know before? What the end of all things was. For certainly it is the same as that which all things desire. We have deduced that that is goodness. And so we must agree that the end of all things is the good. The purpose of all things is the good. It's not what is good for all things. It's the good. Go back to the handout or the allegory of the cave. The summum bonum the highest good, God. God equals happiness, equals goodness, equals divinity, equals power, equals self-sufficiency, equals love, equals justice, equals beauty, equals, right? So the poem, whoever deeply searches out the truth and will not be decoyed down false byways, shall turn unto himself his inward gaze. Inward. You gotta roll your eyes back. Okay, why? Why inward? Shall bring his wandering thoughts in circle home. See, the thoughts grow out of the mind, they go over here, they go over here, they go over here. Why in circle home? Well, if they're out here, do they just come boom, straight home? No, the idea is they do this. And teach his heart that what it seeks abroad, it holds in its own treasuries within. Skipping several lines, line 11. The seed of truth lies hidden deep within and teaching, teaching fans the spark to take new life. Teaching 
is like the water. It drips on the seed and causes it to germinate. Line 15. And if the muse of Plato speaks the truth, man but recalls what once he knew and lost. So go back for a moment. Whoever deeply searches out the truth shall turn unto himself his inward gaze. Christ is asked, hold on, we gotta find it. Um, Christ is asked, lost my spot. Um, after he heals 10 lepers and one comes back, this is chapter 17, I believe, Luke 17. The 10 lepers are cleansed, one comes back. And Jesus says, so chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says, so Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to the one leper who came back, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Okay, cool. And then he's asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come. And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Right? The kingdom of God is within you. Now, hold on just one second. Later, um, sorry, earlier in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33. Okay, Christ, this is Sermon on the Mount. Christ has taught the disciples and, and such how to pray. And then he goes on and teaches about, you know, laying up for yourself treasures and heaven, etc., etc. And he says, um, verse 31, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for after, after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Okay. So he says, the kingdom of God is within, look within, and he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and he does it in the context of <coughs> not worrying about earthly needs, desires, et cetera, et cetera, right? Turn unto himself his inward gaze. What, what has she been saying so far, all throughout books one, two, and three, where do people seek happiness? Out there. Not inside. She says, line 11, the seed of truth, it's inside. It's inside. Interestingly, not sure that this is relevant, but I'm going to throw it out there. In book seven, the Harry Potter novel, there's a scene where Harry and Dumbledore really relive one of Dumbledore's memories. And in that memory, Dumbledore has an interview with or interviews Lord Voldemort. And they talk about an old argument. And Voldemort says, ah, the old argument. And the argument is who's, who's kind of power Whose kind of magic is more powerful? Lord Voldemort asserts his dark magic is more powerful. Dumbledore asserts love is more powerful. And Voldemort says, 
I still haven't seen anything that proves it. In all my researches, in all my wanderings and searching throughout the world, I've not seen anything that says your kind of magic is more powerful than mine. But Dumbledore says, perhaps you've not been looking in the right place. Where's Voldemort looking? Out there. He never looks inward. Okay. Um, let's see here. The poem ends. And if the muse of Plato speaks the truth, man but recalls what once he knew and lost. And that's an allusion to the Platonic doctrine of the pre-existence of the, of the soul. The idea that souls, human souls, exist with God in heaven, and when a child is conceived, boom, that soul goes down to God, right? Uh, you see that idea in um, William Wordsworth's Ode, Intimations of Immortality, okay? About having these, these remembrances of things that happened before one was born. Not things down here, but these awarenesses. And that's what the whole, the whole Socratic method is based upon. Socrates taught this, for example. In the Socratic method, which some of you have prob are probably familiar with, if you were homeschooled or private schooled, you probably had you know, classes that operated by the Socratic method. You might have some other classes do, where you know, question and dialogue are used to arrive at quote unquote truth. Not much truth is arrived at in most college classes anymore. And the idea is that the truth, you've got the truth within you. And all it takes is adept questioning on my part or adept questioning on a teacher's part to bring that knowledge out of you. And in, I can't remember which of the um, dialogues, it's one of the cloud con, if I remember correctly, Socrates demonstrates this. They bring a slave child who's never been educated you know, in, and Socrates, you know, through a lengthy dialogue, asks him a series of questions, and the kid proves the Pythagorean theorem. You know, about the right angle, I think it's the Pythagorean theorem, about the right um, angle of a, or the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the square of the leg and the um, height, okay? So, that's what's being alluded to there. And I kind of wonder, You know, because people after Plato, Christians after Plato, essentially kind of suggested, you know, you, you, can, you can kind of not literally accept the preexistence of the soul, but you can answer it by suggesting because in the Christian tradition, man is made, humanity is made in the image of God, it's part of that image of God that gives us those tools to answer those questions, so to speak. It's not that we're remembering things from heaven. It's that we are, you know, ultimately going there. And so there are these kind of hidden clues, almost, if you like, right? So um, she says, Lady Philosophy, page 79, uh, just after halfway along the page. I think little remains for me to do before you acquire happiness and return safe and sound to your true homeland. You're almost there. What's his true homeland? God. Return safe and sound? Well, it's pretty soon. I mean, bear in mind, he's in prison and he writes this within a year of his execution, right? They keep talking. And let's see, page 80, she says at the top, in response to um, bottom of 79, she says, okay, so, so God regulates everything. He orders everything by himself, right? And he says, yeah. And God's good, right? And he says, yes. Page 80. So if he regulates, he orders the whole structure and, and let's say pattern of the universe after himself and he is ultimate good then the order and structure and pattern of the universe must also be good right so that it is top of page 80 by goodness that he rules all things since he rules them by himself and we've agreed he is the good 
It's this, which is the helm and rudder. The helm, the part of the ship that contains the wheel, the guides of the rudder that determines what direction the ship goes. God is the helm and rudder of the universe. Okay. Boethius, yep, I agree. So she says, middle of the page. So since we're right in thinking that God controls all things by the helm of goodness, and all things, as I've said, have a natural inclination towards the good, and we can't doubt that, and that they are willingly govern and willingly obey the desires of him who controls them, that then everything is in harmony and accord with God, the helmsman. Boethius, okay. It is necessarily so, for it would hardly seem a happy government if it were like a yoke imposed upon, un she says, okay. So there is nothing which could preserve its own nature as well as go against God nothing. And if it tried, it wouldn't make any progress. Right? No. So she then asks, is there anything then which might either wish to be or be able to withstand this supreme goodness? This supreme good, excuse me. I just thought of another illusion. I don't think so. It is the supreme good then. Lady Philosophy says, bottom of page 80, which mightily and sweetly orders all things. They notice what she's gotten him to admit. God, who is supremely good, is constructing and ordering the way everything occurs in the universe. And therefore, the way everything occurs in the universe is directed towards good and is good. What was he doing at the beginning of the book? The very beginning. He was lamenting his downfall. He was bewailing his estate. He was moaning, griping, complaining, and bitching about his life. And now he says, top of page 81, I am now ashamed of the stupidity of all my railing. Ah, oh, the damn fool. I should have shot him. Okay. So, so she asks. No one could doubt that God, or asserts, no one could doubt that God is omnipotent? He says, no. Is there nothing omnipotent power cannot do? Uh, no. Then can God do evil? If God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and being omnipotent, there's nothing he can do, can he do evil? No. But I thought he was all I thought he was omnipotent. Look at her response. Evil is nothing, since that is what he, God, cannot do, who can do anything. What is evil? What's the definition of evil? It's, it's not, you know, the antithesis of good. It's the absence of good. Goodness is existence. Evil is the opposite of that. Nothingness. And that's when Boethius says in response to her so that evil is nothing since that is what he cannot do who can do anything you are playing with me aren't you by weaving a labyrinth of arguments from which i can't find the way out but one moment you go in where you'll come out and another you come out where you went in or are you creating a wonderful circle of divine simplicity just now this is boethius just now you began with happiness and said it was the highest good, and you said it was to be found in God. Then you began arguing that God himself was also the supreme good and perfect happiness, and added as a kind of bonus that no one could be happy unless he was also divine. You said that the very form of the good was identical with the substance of God and of happiness, and you taught us that unity itself was the same as the good. 
because all things had a natural inclination to it. Top of page 82. Then you argue that God rules the universe by the helm of goodness, that all things obey willingly and that evil is nothing, all of which you unfolded without the help of any external aid. That is any external argument, but with one internal proof grafted upon another so that each drew its credibility from that which preceded. That is, you built argument upon argument upon argument upon argument upon argument. Each one logically proven and truthful. Okay? And she replies and says, I'm not mocking you. Through the favor of God, whom we prayed to a moment ago, we have achieved the greatest of all things. That is, what has just occurred came as a result of our prayer to God. And what's the greatest of all things? The form of the divine substance is such that it does not spread out into outside things or take up into itself anything from them. Look at the beginning of the poem, page 82. Happy the man whose eyes once could perceive the shining fount of gold, fount, the source. Happy he whose unchecked mind could leave the chains of earth behind. Gold, the highest purity, the, the source of all riches. She's not talking about literal gold. Okay. And then she launches into the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice is, dies and is taken by Pluto. And Orpheus, a great singer, goes down to hell, goes down to Hades, plays his harp, plays his harp and sings so beautifully that Hades agrees, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And he says, let me take Eurydice back above. Let me take my wife back to the world of living, you can have it. One condition, you must lead, she must follow, and you can never turn and look back to her. Your eyes have always gotta be looking forward, okay? We get a long description, and he keeps going, and he keeps looking forward, until they're almost there. And then what happens? Page 84. Love, lines 48 and following. Love unto love itself is law. Alas, close to the bounds of night, Orpheus backwards turned his sight, and looking lost her twice to fate. He lost her the first time, and now he's lost her forever. For you, Boethius, the legend I relate, you who seek the upward way from metaphorical Hades, the world of death, to the world of light and life, for you, the legend I relate, you who seek the upward way to lift your mind into the day. Go back to this for a moment. To go from the darkness down here to the real light up here. Right? For who gives in and turns his eye back to darkness from the sky? Loses while he looks below, <coughs> all that up with him may go. If you look backwards, you will never incline, you will never arise. That's why, kind of, to give a philosophical proof for, example of, you know, um, Christ calls one of the disciples, can't remember who, might be Peter, and calls one of his disciples, or calls a disciple. And the person says, you know, let me go bury my father first. Christ says, you know, follow me, 
let the dead bury their dead. And then he gives a little parable about the plowman who will not plow a field if he turns around and looks backwards. You got to look forwards. You got to know where you're going. You have to be able to follow the path. All throughout the Old Testament, as an example here, and I think we'll probably stop with this. Yeah. All throughout the Old Testament, followers of God are told, obey my commandments, follow my way. Well, what's the follow my way mean? Because an awful lot of people think that just means, oh, that just means obeying God. Well, yeah, it does. But it also means what? Follow my path. You know, interestingly, when in the book of Genesis, God calls Abram. He later changes his name to Abraham. He says, go in the way that I shall teach you. And in that, he's, he's not leading Abraham. That is, you don't have God here and Abraham here, and they're, you know, doing this. God says, I will walk beside you. Right? And then later on, you know, with Moses and stuff, we have, you know, I will go before you. And during the day, he goes as a cloud. And during the night, he goes as a pillar of fire and such. But with Abram, he's, you know, I will walk beside you. But if you follow in my way, if you obey my commandments, your descendants shall be. And you get this, this idea of listening and obeying and walking. You know, and then later on in the New Testament, what do you get? You get Christ who says, I am the way the path, the truth, okay, the commandments, the following, the will, and the life. Because the way and the commandments are what lead to that. That's exactly the point she's making here, right? Orpheus lost what he really sought because he looked backwards, not forwards. He didn't look to the good that he ultimately sought, which was his wife beside him once they got out of Hades. What did he do? He looked to his immediate good. Is she still with me? Rather than the long-term good, will she be with me you know, forever, so to speak? All right, we will stop there. I will do another lecture over book four and post that uh, sometime tomorrow or over the weekend.